before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce Ikigai. Uh, for those who don't know, Ikigai is a wellness-focused co-working space in Nairobi. We have three locations in Westlands, Lavington, and Lower Kabete, and we have a fourth coming up soon on Riverside Drive. And essentially, what we do is we offer individuals, SMEs, startups, creators, and corporates with beautifully designed and safe workspaces for teams. And um, our memberships are designed to be flexible and to promote well-being and essentially take the hustle out of running an office space so that you can focus on your core business. We're also really excited to announce our reopening. From when the first cases were announced in Kenya, we took the time to focus and prioritize the safety of our spaces for current and future members. And after putting in place several key health and safety measures, we are so happy to announce that our spaces um, have been open since June and we're fully operational and we're happy to see our members back at work. If you would like to know more about Ikigai, please do visit our website to learn about our memberships and also what we've done in terms of health and safety. Great, so on to today's event. Um, as businesses locally and globally look to resume you know, operations and in-person staffing for essential roles. There's a lot to think about and to consider um, to ensure that the spaces that teams go back to are safe to work from and also to avoid, you know, any cases arising from the workplace. And what we've done today is we've teamed up with um, Kangwana and Co, um, who will be leading today's presentation. We are joined by Kevin Oino, who will be taking us through a two-part presentation well, we'll cover, um, he'll give us an overview of the legal requirements for providing a safe um, workplace and also how to apply the law to topical issues to guarantee a safe work environment. As Kevin proceeds with the presentation, please do share your questions in the Q&A chat and we'll also, we'll get to them once the presentation is over. Okay, great, uh, that's it for me. We can now hand over to Kevin. Kevin Thank you so much, Lisa, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, welcome everybody to this webinar. And uh, we'll be doing a safe return to the workplace, a legal perspective of returning to the workplace. So without further ado, I will proceed to the gist of this presentation. So as you all know, there was a virus outbreak from China, Wuhan uh, in 2020. It's not been one of those years where things have been normal. Everything else has been chaotic, we can say, but we are glad that even as we announced the virus outbreak in Kenya on 13th March 2020, the government decided to set about certain measures that were supposed to curb the spread of the virus. It was supposed to just uh, limit, uh, suppress the, uh, the spread of the virus in the country. And uh, some of those measures, as you already know, are the partial lockdown that was presently lifted. Uh, curfews, dawn to dusk curfews, as well as travel restrictions that uh, slowly, slowly these measures are being re uh, turned up uh, and we, we are considering a first reopening of the economy. Now today, as we consider a first reopening of the economy, it is important to consider certain measures uh, that we do, not, we do not reopen an economy only for uh, an influx of cases of coronavirus to hit again. So, Without uh, much ado, I'll go back to uh, my presentation. We'll, it is a two-part presentation, an overview of the legal requirements for a safe return to the workplace, and secondly, applying the law to topical issues or the topical questions that have arisen so far on guaranteeing a safe return to the workplace. So, uh, as you know, the new normal now has been uh, governments around the world encouraging people to just adopt technology, avoid, uh, meeting physical meetings and virtual meeting uh, encouraging virtual meetings in the process what people are calling uh, working from home i mean workplace the workplace has fundamentally changed since the virus setting in kenya now uh as as you, even those measures are encouraged the government is also on the other hand just trying to enact uh, measures including taxation measures among other fixed fiscal policies just to ensure that uh we return the economy is resuscitated back to life uh without uh delving much into that you 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 would want to consider uh the finance act 2020 some of the measures in fact on taxation such as the reduction of corporate tax 
uh, as well as the reduction of BAT in the tax amendment laws 2020. You'd want to consider those as an employer because it, it essentially is aimed at just reopening the country uh, economy, putting more money into the pockets of employees as well as employers, and just measures to see us go back to normal because the new normal is untenable in some instances but we hope we will overcome as a country so very fast i will be looking at just uh, the legal and uh, regulatory basis the, st the statutes that have been put in place to uh, just guarantee a safe return to the workplace just looking at the regulations that have been published or what has what statutes actually uh, confer or um, mandate employers to guarantee a safe and healthy workplace for the employees even as we resume operations so very first the first one is the health act number 21 of 2017 now this act is an act that uh, establishes that uh, functions health the health functions have been devolved it recognizes that a health has been devolved in this country and that the same is shared between the national government and the county government so as we coordinate efforts towards tackling coronavirus or the su suppressing coronavirus or preventing the further spread of coronavirus in the country this act is essential in just the coordinated effort by both the national government and the county government secondly is the occupational safety and health act number 15 of 2017 now this is the act that concerns itself with the safety and general well-being of the employees in the workplace. Uh, thirdly, is the occupational safety and health post COVID-19 return to work advisory. Now, this advisory was published on 29th June 2020 by the Directorate of Occupational Safety and Health. And uh, what it establishes is a number of measures that employers are supposed to consider even as we embark on returning back to work, as we deal, we, we go through this first reopening of the economy. So among such, such measures are highlighted in the latter parts of this uh, presentation, and we, we, we will delve into the finer details of that as we go along. Um, there is the fourth one, the tripartite memorandum of understanding between the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection the Federation of Kenyan Employers, as well as co to the Central Organization of Trade Unions. This tripartite uh, memorandum or MOU was signed on 20th April 2020, and it fundamentally discusses or it's, it is an understanding between these three partners that are concerned with matters of uh, employees rights or the labor institutions in this country how are we going to go back to a safe return to the workplace and it requires employers to provide certain minimums just to guarantee the safety of employees in the workplace uh, the fifth one is the public health act now this act is uh, concerns itself which mandates the government to just take measures towards protecting the general public from any just protecting the general public health that is what the act does um, the other one is uh, the public health prevention control and suppression of covid-19 rules 2020 now these ones were published by the ministry of health uh, and as as the title says it is the purpose is for the prevention control and suppression of covid-19 but the most fundamental bit of it is the reporting duties that have been imposed on landlords as well as employers within their workplaces or their premises to just curb the, the, the spread of covid-19 uh, the next one is uh, the occupiers liability act now this act is is fundamental uh, whereas uh, both in the workplace as well as persons who own premises persons who are physical occupation of a workplace physical possession of the workplace or a, a premise or as well as you control you admit people into the buildings or, or your premises rather so it establishes certain bare minimums that a person who is a physical occupation or physical possession of a premise is supposed to undertake when it comes to visitors coming to the place or even where in the case of a landlord, the tenant, what are the bare minimums for a tenant, uh, just guaranteeing the safety of such persons in, within those premises. Uh, lastly, is the Work Injury Benefits Act. Now, this act is uh, an act that is established with the primary goal of facilitating the compensation of employees who suffer injuries in the workplace. So having laid that legal and uh, regulatory uh, framework for the safe return to the workplace, I will delve into uh, part one of the presentation. Now, 
This will be an overview of the legal requirements for a safe return to work. So uh, this particular presentation is going to be in the form of a Q&A, as you've been duly informed by Lisa. And I, I have a few questions that I'll be answering as we go along with this presentation. So the first question is, should employers only limit testing to those who exhibit COVID-19 symptoms or to on-site employees as opposed to those who regularly work from home? Now, Within employment contracts, there is uh, an established workplace where persons who are employers are supposed to report to. It is important to understand that this testing should be limited to those places as defined within the employment contract. So testing in that regard is supposed to just guarantee a safe and healthy workplace for individuals within that workplace. So persons who are not within that workplace, there is no duty on the employers to just ensure that they are tested and all, because even testing in itself right now is a voluntary process. However, I'd like you to note that there is no requirement, there is no statutory requirement or even a regulatory uh, measure that has been put in place requiring employers to test employees when they get to the workplace. This is because you, the presumption is not every employer is uh, is, is, uh, has the expertise to just test and discover is someone post COVID-19 positive or are they negative? An employer ordinarily is just the duty rests at just ensuring a safe and a healthy workplace, not the testing. So what an employer really can do is request employees or even other employees to go get tested and then come back to the workplace with a COVID-19 free certificate or a certificate of fit fitness where they indicate to the employer that they've been tested and they've been found that they do not pose any risk to the workplace. So testing really should be limited to personal to on-site employees. The next question is, should testing be mandatory? or can employees consent to a COVID-19 test? Well, looking at the nature of the Constitution of Kenya 2010, uh, it is pro rights and freedoms, which is a good thing. And therefore, in light, when you, when you look at COVID-19, the testing process itself, it is intrusive, it is obtrusive, it is the nature, it's, it's not really comfortable. And an individual would like to think that, whereas uh, the, the Constitution guarantees them, under Article 29, as well as Article 31, that they have the, the right to the security of the person, as well as they have the freedom and right to privacy. In this instance, unfortunately, those rights do not kick in because the same constitution that confers the right to privacy, as well as the right to the security of the person, and against such obtrusive and intrusive tests, it's the same constitution that limits the same rights. So the rights are limited to the extent that it is justifiable and it is a reasonable limitation of those rights. Looking at uh, the testing process in itself, it is the limitation is justified as the purpose of it is a utilitarian purpose. That is, the purpose is for the greater protection of the greater majority. So those rights have been limited to that extent and a person therefore does not have an option of consenting or not consenting. The test is mandatory. And this is even followed by when you read section 13, the reading of section 13 of the Public Health Act, it imposes a duty on the government itself to take reasonable measures towards protecting the general public, guaranteeing the highest standard of health for all citizens. This is also in pursuant to Article 43 of the Constitution that the government is supposed to guarantee the highest attainable standard of health. So testing is, is part of the measures that are being taken to just ensure the general safety of the public uh, protecting public health in that regard and therefore we are preventing a disease that may wipe out a great percentage of the population. Therefore testing is, is aimed at protecting the public. So individual rights will be suspended in that regard. So testing is mandatory. Question three, should labor unions or work councils be consulted prior to implementing such a testing requirement? Yes, yes. Uh, on matters of uh, rights of employees, uh, reading uh, Article 41 of the Constitution, it guarantees certain rights. And these rights include the rights to be members of labor unions. You read a reading of that Article 41 of the Constitution further dictates that uh, members of any union 
such as let's take for instance Kotu that represents uh, it's the overall umbrella body for trade unions in this country. So whenever it's an issue of the rights of employees, Kotu being the highest representative body for employees must see to it that they are, their opinion is uh, or their opinion counts as part of those deliberations. Fortunately, in this instance, um, when it comes to the testing and just the implementation of uh, measures to ensure a safe and a healthy work environment, they, these deliberations already took place and uh, the Ministry of, uh, Social, of Labor and Social Protection, uh, the Federation of Kenyan Employers, as well as CO2, the Central Organization of Trade Unions, on April 20th, uh, they decided to sign a memorandum, and this is what I earlier on alluded to as the tripartite MOU. These being the highest representative bodies, they took part in these deliberations, and in a later stage of this presentation, I will be telling you what, what that memo, uh, memorandum entails. So labor unions should be involved every step of the way in rights of employees what procedures can employers implement if and when employees refuse to consent to required tests. I have already said it before that employees do not have the option of refusing or requiring, the, 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 the requirement for their consent is thrown out of the window by dint of Article 24 of the Constitution on the limitation of rights. So in this instance, it is a utilitarian purpose that we are supposed to achieve. That is, the greatest majority should, should have the benefit of this test. The benefit accrues to the greatest majority. And therefore, testing is in person to a, a greater goal that is um, uh, uh, rest, a greater goal that rests with the government as part of its duty just to ensure public safety and the general health of the citizenry. So an employee who refuses to get tested should not be admitted to the premises or the workplace. They should be denied entry into the workplace. So that is the result, uh, the, uh, the redress mechanism that is available at the moment. Question five. Can employers require all returning employees to certify certain health information regarding exposure to COVID-19? Yes, yes. Uh, looking at uh, the nature and the evolution of COVID-19, there is a group of individuals who are considered vulnerable. And this involves, includes persons with pre-existing conditions. So the presumption when an employer requires this information is that, uh, the information is required just to ascertain how vulnerable are employees in the workplace. Is, are there people in the workplace who are above the age of 50, 58? Are there people in the workplace who have pre-existing conditions such as diabetes, uh, high blood pressure? And those, those conditions exacerbate the, uh, the, the spread of COVID-19. And therefore, an employer requesting this information, it's for the purpose of just ensuring that they can put in place adequate measures to ensure that persons who are high risk or persons who are vulnerable or persons who are susceptible to COVID-19 are adequate measures are taken to just consider them so that they don't come to the workplace or they don't expose themselves to the risk of COVID-19. So employers can request that information. What procedures are on privacy and discretion if an employee tests positive for COVID-19? So Having dictated or, or having uh, alluded to the general requirement for certain information regarding the general uh, uh, certain conditions, it's private information about the health of an employee that an employer requests. The first thing that the employer should realize is that the taking of that information or the requesting of that information should be subject to a condition that that information will not be unnecessarily revealed without the consent of the employee, of course. So. The employer has a duty, both in pursuance to Article 31 of the Constitution of Kenya 2010, as well as the Data Protection Act 2019. So an employer, uh, once you get that information, protect the information, as well as someone testing positive, the first duty that lies on the employer, pursuant to the public health, the prevention, control, and suppression of COVID-19 rules 2020, is that that employer will report any suspected case or any proven confirmed case of COVID-19 to the nearest uh, government authority or the nearest health facility. So 
as long as they do that, that information should not be even shared with employees in the workplace for obvious reasons. We've seen the stigmatization around persons who are who test positive for COVID-19. So just protect that information jealously and do not unnecessarily reveal the information as an employer. Question seven, what can I expect from my landlord in terms of taking precaution against COVID-19 and the steps to be taken if there is a confirmed case in the building? Now, a landlord is, uh, is defined, uh, or a landlord is described as an occupier under the Occupier's Liability Act, Cap 34. So looking at that, and a landlord is someone uh, is considered an, an occupier. And secondly, an occupier under the Occupier's Liability Act, Cap 34, owes a duty, a common duty of care to all persons who work, uh, get, get into their premises. So a landlord, must ensure the safety, the reasonable safety of the premises to which he lets to him, he or she lets to the tenants. And this duty can only be limited insofar as there is an existing contractual agreement between that landlord and the tenant. Therefore, uh, before before even getting to the point where we are discussing the limitation of the duty of common care to all persons uh, entering the premises. What, what would you expect of a, an occupier, a landlord of a building, what it, both in the setup of a tenancy agreement or even uh, in, the, in the workplace? So there will be common areas that employers or, or landlords have control of, depending on the contractual agreement. So the employer in that regard is supposed to just guarantee the safety of those places. So the contractual agreement steps in where a landlord decides to let in a tenant, say an employer, who then is, uh, says the, the landlord, the landlord tenant relationship dictates that the employer as the tenant in this instance is responsible for the areas that are let out to them. So within a premise, the landlord will be responsible for everything except those areas as defined by the contractual agreement or the license agreement that an employer as a tenant will be responsible for ensuring the safety within those areas. However, back to a landlord generally without um, the limitation of contractual agreements, a landlord is supposed to just provide hand washing facilities or sanitizers at the entrance of those buildings are supposed to just put notices in conspicuous places requesting persons to wash their hands as obvious as it may seem. They have to put those notices just to remove the liability from them, as well as where there is a confirmed case of uh, coronavirus in their, in their, within their premises, they're supposed to notify the nearest government authority as well as the health authorities and take active steps towards cordoning off those areas until the threat is completely dealt with. So recap that uh, just provide as a landlord provide hand washing facilities put in place uh, notices reminding people to wash their hands keeping their social distance as well as you could also have a guard at the entrance who's going to use the thermal gun just to test uh, or uh, test the temperatures body temperatures any person with temperatures higher than 37.5 degrees should not be admitted to the premises question eight what happens if there is a confirmed case of COVID-19 in my building, but not in my office, not affecting any of my staff. This is closely related to the one I just dealt with on the landlord. So there's a confirmed case within those premises and uh, it does not get to your office. But the problem is uh, we are not yet at that stage where we can actually tell that we are secure from the virus. So it will be highly advisable for an employer to shut down operations until the threat is, is completely dealt with. That will mean uh, the area has to be fumigated. And this, this just happened, uh, and a notice was issued yesterday at Makadara Law Courts. Uh, they've issued a notice that they will not be opening tomorrow. So it has to fumigate the area. So the moment that confirmed cases of, of COVID-19 in a place shut down the premises, and just work towards steps of fumigating the areas and just eliminating the potential threat of infections in the, 
in the premises, within the premises or within the workplace. Question nine, how often should employees be tested? Now, there are no existing regulations on the frequency within which persons are supposed to be tested. What, what we would recommend is that employees who interact with people, say, at funerals, at weddings, or even during their travels within the country, as travel within the country has now been uh, allowed, is now lo uh, lawful, those persons must take individual responsibility towards just getting tested so that when they report back to the workplace, they do not pose a necessary health risk to the employees who did not attend the same events or just you don't want to expose other fellow employees. I mean, it's only human to do that. So the duty lies with individual employees to take individual responsibility where they engage in social activities such as funeral weddings or where they travel. So just get tested if you engage in any of that so that you do not pose any risk to the workplace. Question 10, should an employer provide communal eating and drinking services in the office? Well, this is a straight no because any communal activities are shunned upon right now because engaging in communal activities increases the risk of exposing persons to the virus or contracting the virus. So even within the office setup, an employer should avoid or not, should not even avoid, should not provide any communal services such as eating or drinking or even communal activities where possible do not engage in such. Question 11, how does an employee prove that they contracted COVID-19 during the course of their duties? And is it their obligation to prove this or the employer to disprove this? Now, the first point to note on this one is, when you look at the Work Injury Benefits Act of 207, it talks about occupational diseases. There's a whole schedule on occupational diseases. COVID-19 does not rank as one of them, However, uh, there is the provision under Section 38 of the same Act. There is a provision of any other disease that is contracted within the workplace. So COVID-19 might just fall there after interrogation by the Director of Occupational Safety and Health Act. It might just be declared as one of those occupational diseases that we are facing in 2020. So from the onset, it is, it is important to understand that there will only be compensation for a disease or occupational disease that is actually contracted during and in the course of the employment. So for a person to prove that, the moment an employee alleges that they did contract COVID-19 during and in the course of their activities or executing their duties at the workplace, the burden immediately shifts towards the employer and it is, it is the employer to prove that they took all reasonable measures, that it was impossible for the workplace to be a place where someone could be susceptible to the coronavirus. How does this come into play? That for an employer to do that, an employer has to demonstrate that they did abide by all the guidelines issued by the government, as well as the Ministry of Health. And in addition to that, they did take all reasonable measures to prevent the, uh, the possibility that someone might contract the virus at the workplace. Therefore, insofar as the duty is defined by the acts and regulations, an employer is, is only supposed to uh, demonstrate that they did act reasonably, reasonably and that they did take all measures necessary as stipulated by the government to prevent it within the workplace. That any ordinary, these measures should be what a reasonable employer would have taken in the circumstances. So an employee who alleges that they did contract it in and during the course of their duties or in and during the course of executing their duties, that employee, the moment they allege the burden shifts, it goes to the employer to disprove that allegation. And the standard will be by going by the statutory declarations and the guidelines and regulations that have been published in so far as just controlling, suppressing the spread of COVID-19 is concerned. Uh, question 12, with the rising number of COVID-19 positive cases, should offices reopen? Now, 
this is a tough one. It is a delicate balance has to be attained in this instance. And we throw it back to the employer to search within themselves, consider all circumstances, the need to balance between the reopening of the office and the risk to the health of the employees. Therefore, once an employer balances the two and finds what outweighs which, the employer will make a decision based on that. To reopen or not to reopen is a decision that right now, following the first reopening, is thrown back to the employers to do as the as the discretion tells them. Question 13, what types of notices should an employer have on the entrance of their office? Now, these are just two, part of the sensitization, part of giving information out there. An employer should have notices reminding people to wash their hands or sanitize where such services are provided. Ask employees, just let them know that it is important to wear face masks or face coverings at all times within the office. Put in place measures to just uh, remind people, hey, or 1.5 meter distance between individual employees within the workplace. Question 14. What is deemed as an essential service? Is it limited to the government guidelines or can the employer determine who is an essential worker or not? Now, this question comes as a result of a government uh, directive that was issued uh, the first time we, uh, we had the dawn to dust curfew from 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. The whole declaration of essential service providers was to ensure that persons who would be caught outside the curfew hours would be persons who provide essential services and therefore they will not be arrested or they will not be subjected to harassment as we've seen by the police. So looking, looking at right now, those measures were relaxed, but the same essential service providers have still been maintained. However, within individual workplaces, an employer might, according to their discretion, decide who is essential to the workplace such that the workplace cannot run without them being physically present at the workplace. So such persons may involve, may include people such as people who are in the management, people who issue directions and all that, just people in the management to simply put. So such persons might be deemed as essential service providers by individual employers. However, it is important for employers to also note that such persons will not enjoy the privilege that is of being uh, part of persons such as uh, the government had decided to be essential service providers. And just to let you know who those persons are, they include persons in the telecommunications industry, persons in the medical field. Those are persons who are just thought to be or declared to be essential service providers. And therefore, if, if an employer decides to determine and say, you must come to the workplace because you are a, an essential service provider. That is fine. You can go back to the workplace. But then it is important to also note that you will not be enjoying the privileges of going back home past the curfew hours because the government does not recognize you as such. So the don't to dust curfew remains and that should be abided by to just avoid being on the wrong side of the law as you, you've seen recently. Question 15, can an employer refuse entry or reject someone from their office space should they fail to adhere to safety protocols? Yes, uh, an employer has that duty to just guarantee a safe and a healthy work environment. A, safety, a safe and healthy work environment is jeopardized by an employee who does not adhere to the safety protocols that have been put in place. So in order to significantly reduce or completely eliminate the threat or the risk of persons in the office place or in the employee workplace contracting coronavirus, such a person who refuses to abide by or to adhere to the safety protocols must be removed from the work environment or the workplace. Question 16, what does PPE equipment entail? Now, I, I will allude, I will go back to the tripartite uh, MOU between the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, the Federation of Kenyan Employers, as well as court to the Central Organization of Trade Unions. 
in this, uh, that tripartite MOU dictated that employers shall provide PPE equipment to the employees. This is protective clothing and personal equipment. This, this equipment are supposed to help curb the control or spread of coronavirus in the workplace. So the question really is, what is necessary in your workplace? Does an office need a full gown? Does an office need gum boots? Does an office need that? No. What an office needs is just the mask and by the greatest stretch of it, hand gloves. So it is, it is important for individual employers to just see to it that they provide PPE for what is necessary. In addition to that, it should be noted that Section 10 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act mandates employers to just provide protection, guarantee the safety of their workplace without charging employees for these PPE. And that is, that is what the tripartite MOU really entails, that you will provide PPE to the employees, but at no cost to them whatsoever. So you cannot deduct it from the remuneration because you, you gave them face masks. No, that is illegal. Uh, the second part of this presentation, just applying the law to topical questions or issues that have arisen so far in so far as the legal framework is concerned on a safe return to the workplace. Uh, the first question is, are employers legally required to implement health and safety measures at the workplace? Yes, uh, section six of the Occupational Safety and Health Act requires each and every employer to ensure the safety, health, and general welfare of employees in the workplace. This duty is owed to each and every employee at the workplace, individually and collectively. Therefore, it is a statutory duty imposed by the Act on employers. Question two, what are the mandatory health and safety requirements? Now, looking at section six of the Act, Occupational Safety and Health Act, these are the bare minimums that have been put there just to ensure a safe and a healthy workplace. So one, provide protective clothing and protective equipment and at no cost at all. That is section 10 of the Act, as well as the tripartite MOU between the representatives of employees or the highest labor institutions in this country. Number two, employers must provide adequate information on the safety and health in the workplace. This is just to ensure uh, it, is, it is a safe and a healthy workplace. But three, you'd expect uh, the government from time to time to issue directives, regulations on coronavirus, even as we go towards uh, the peak of the virus. So as the government will be issuing these directives, employers must adjust hard and fast to these safety and health regulations in the workplace. Just comply, comply, comply. Another one, the fourth one, ensure social distancing of not less than two meters between employees in all directions. Now, this is, uh, this is pursuant to the advisory that was issued by the Directorate of Occupational Safety and Health Act that they said it is two meters within the workplace, the advisory on the return to workplace. It is two meters. However, international standards, WHO, as well as the ministry, we've been hearing 1.5 meters. However, if they dictate that two meters is the safest, then there's, there's no harm in doing that. The practicality is questionable, but yes, that is what they require. And employers have no option but to adhere to that particular provision or requirement. Uh, fifth, reporting any cases of COVID-19. Now, as I've said before, the public health, the control, suppression, and prevention of coronavirus uh, 2019 rule, 2020 rules, these rules require every, every employer as well as every landlord to uh, report any cases of coronavirus, any suspected case of coronavirus, or any confirmed case of coronavirus to the government authorities or the nearest health facility. Uh, uh, sixth. The sixth one would be that in a workplace where there are machines involved, an employer must take active steps towards ensuring the frequent cleaning of those machinery just to reduce the exposure that uh, an employee using those equipment will, will be exposed to. So 
put in place measures such as regularly cleaning those equipment, sanitizing, ensuring that persons who use, where, where possible, by the way, where possible, get, uh, provide each and every employee with their own equipment. But where that is not possible, an employer must ensure that those uh, equipment or machinery are constantly cleaned or sanitized and just uh, employees are using gloves to handle them. Lastly, an employer must carry out appropriate and constant assessment of risks uh, in the workplace. This must be done in conjunction with the employees. Looking at section six of the Occupational Safety and Health Act, employees must, and the employer must consult the employees on what are the risks in the workplace. Looking at operations in the workplace, you deliberations should be held between the employer and the employees just to assess the risk to the workplace and how to mitigate those risks that is in persons to section six again of the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Question three, are employers legally required to provide employees with PPE? Yes, uh, I have said this before. Section 10 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act 207 requires that uh, an employer must provide uh, equipment that just guarantees the safety of the employees at the workplace with no cost at all being incurred by the employees. So it should be at no cost at all to the employees. This is also, this was followed by the tripartite MOU between uh, the representatives of employers and government as well as uh, employees. Now, employers will provide PPE uh, in the workplace at absolutely no charge to the employees. Question four. Can employers require returning employees to wear face coverings in the workplace? Yes, it is mandatory. And this is the what came from the Directorate of Occupational Health and Safety Services. Uh, that directorate is set up under the Occupational Safety and Health Act. And the advisory dictates that at all times within the workplace, employees uh, must wear face coverings, face masks, they must sanitize, they must keep the social kilometer social distance between individual employees just to prevent uh, the threats of coronavirus spreading the workplace. Oh, oh, just before I forget, it's also some some may think it is it is these face coverings are uncomfortable and hence this question. It is it is hard, it is difficult, but it should and must be done just to prevent the risk of coronavirus spreading the workplace. So if you can't abide by that as an employee, step out, out of the workplace, go get a breather out there, but do not remove your face coverings within the workplace. You'll be exposing both the other employees as well to the threat, as well as uh, your employer to unnecessary uh, claims for occupational disease that was contracted in and during the course of employment. So employers must keep their guard on that, strictly watch that employees are wearing their face masks at all times within the workplace. Question five, in the event that an employee says that they may have contracted the coronavirus due to exposure at work or commuting to and from work, what will be the legal implication to an employer? So firstly, as I had said before, an employee will only bring a claim against the employer where they contract coronavirus due to an exposure while uh, what this, it says it's in and during the course of their employment or executing their duties at work. So the first part of uh, the claim by an employee must be that they did contract coronavirus in and during the execution of their duties. While looking at jurisprudence on the meaning of in and during the course of employment, an employee must demonstrate that the fact that they, they, they were working there did increase the risks of them contracting the virus. And two, they must demonstrate that during the work, uh, they contracted the disease as, as they were executing their duties. So two things to be proven by the employee, that during the course of the employment, as they were executing their lawful duties or the duties for which the employer had asked them to execute, they contracted the virus. 
and two, that as a result of their employment, uh, the risk of contracting the virus was increased. So that is a high standard, but it is what is required by the Work Injury Benefits Act. Now, commuting to and from work is a different issue. Employers must be very careful to note that if where you provide uh, uh, transport services to the workplace and from the workplace, then that might also be considered as part of the employment of the person. So where you provide such uh, services, transport services, and an employee contracts coronavirus while commuting using a transport service that has been provided by the employer, then the employer is exposed to the, that uh, claim for uh, the coronavirus having been contracted at the workplace. Now, what would be the legal implication to an employer? Looking at the Work Injury Benefits Act, Section 38, as I alluded to before, an employee who contracts an occupational disease is supposed to be compensated. If you look at the Act, the second schedule of the Work Injury Benefits Act, 207, there are a number of scheduled diseases and the compensation that is supposed to be as, as a result of just contracting those diseases at the workplace. The legal implication to an employer would be that if an employee is successful in, prov in proving that they did contract the virus or the disease in and during the course of their duties, then they are liable, they're supposed to be compensated. However, uh, it must also be noted that for an employee to prove that, it will be, uh, the employee must demonstrate that the employer was negligent, you know, and being negligent is, uh, there is a standard for that. So what the employee has to prove that the employer had a duty to protect them at the workplace, that the employee uh, reneged the breach that the employer breached that duty, and that as a result of the employ employer breaching that duty, the harm that uh, or there's a direct correlation between the employer breaching the duty to ensure that the workplace is safe and healthy, as well as the injury suffered by the employee. Now, in this instance, as I demonstrated before, an employer must only prove that they did everything within their power uh, by and by, by everything within their power to abide by the provisions of the Ministry of Health, the guidelines, the statute, or the Occupational Safety and Health Act, as well as any other regulations that the government might issue in so far as uh, a safe return to the workplace is concerned. Therefore, an employer who demonstrates that they were not negligent, that they did, they did abide by all the statutory provisions as well as uh, regulations, as well as guidelines that were published by the Ministry of Health and the government. They, with, after having done all that, it was impossible for them to do anything beyond that. So an employer who does not abide by the legal requirements, that is the statutes, the regulations, the uh, guidelines that will be issued, will might might just prove to be have been negligent. So employers have to really be on the lookout for these regulations as well as uh, the guidelines that will be issued and ensure that at the workplace they are adhered to to the uh, to, uh, to the letter. Uh, this is just a continuation of the same. Uh, and and as you can see, um, employers there are certain duties that are also incumbent in that result. So an employ, employer must provide this PPE. An employer who does not provide PPE, therefore can be sued for uh, an employee co having contracted the disease at the workplace. So that should be carefully watched by employers. Uh, question six, what guidelines should employers follow when dealing with health and safety issues? Yes, this is, this is the question on the existing legal and regulatory framework on safe return to the workplace. So as I've demonstrated, as I've said before, they include the following. One, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. And as I said, the act just imposes a duty on employers to just guarantee and ensure that the workplace is safe and healthy for all employees individually and collectively. The second one is the public health, the prevention, control, and suppression of COVID-19 rules 2020. These were published by the Ministry of Health and just prevent, control, and suppress the spread of coronavirus in the workplace. So provide uh, 
any time any time an employee uh, there's a confirmed case of COVID-19 in the workplace, the employee the employee ought to the employer ought to report the same to the nearest health facility as well as to the government. The, last, the third one is the occupational safety and health post COVID-19 return to work advisory published on 29th June 2020. This was published by the Directorate of Occupational Safety and Health Services that, uh, that is mandated to just ensure that there are rules, there are guidelines that ensure the safety of employees at the workplace. So adhering to these ones, we'll encourage a safe and healthy culture in the workplace that does not expose employees to unnecessary risks mm -hmm. or to the risk of coronavirus in the workplace, among other risks in the workplace. The memorandum of understanding between the tripartite social partners, that is the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, the Central Organization of Trade Unions, and the Federation of Kenyan Employers. Now, that memorandum of understanding is that employers will provide PPE, protective clothing and protective equipment to their employees in the workplace. And this will be at absolutely no cost to the employees. Uh, in persons also to section 10 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act 207. Question seven, how can employers prepare for employees who may resist returning to on-site work? While we understand a number of people are panicked about COVID-19, the, the potential of getting it and what it really uh, would uh, do to their families and the dent in that regard, employers must ensure that where possible or employers should facilitate working from home where such services of such employees can be provided from home. However, where that is not possible, an employee must return to on-site work. However, if, if an employee refuses that they feel their health is at risk and that they, cannot, uh, they do not want to expose themselves to the risk of COVID-19, they cannot be forced to report to the workplace. And therefore, a consequence would be that that employment uh, relationship has, has deteriorated and therefore it's, it's only through mutual consent that the employment be terminated as they cannot work at, they cannot work from home and they, they refuse to return to work. Question eight, what alternatives to returning to the traditional or previous office can employers explore? Now, uh, this is, uh, this is one of those alternatives, just looking at it when employees are scared of uh, returning to the workplace or as an employer, you, you find it to be the risk to the health of employees is too great when compared to uh, opening the office. So these are the alternatives that you might want to exploit. And uh, Ikigai, Ikigai provides uh, uh, remote services, I mean, work, shared working spaces. And these shared working places are, are distributed, as they said before, uh, Lovington, Loa Cabete, and all that. So just consider the possibility that someone has already prepared a safe and working place, such as Ikigai's shared workplaces, that you'd, you'd work from such places without carrying the burden of just ensuring that the workplace is safe for you. So where possible, you can explore just remote working and working from offices such as the one provided by Ikigai, as well as where possible, uh, especially where employees can work from home, let them work from home. However, where that is not possible, they can, because of say connectivity issues or the likes, you can exploit uh, the option that is given by Ikigai and their working place spaces. A second alternative would be, uh, where possible, an employer should avoid at all costs uh, physical meetings. Where such meetings are, are a must, then they should see to it that the duration for which those meetings are held is, is so short, such that you, the threat of exposing yourself to the virus as an employer as well as your employees is, is greatly minimized. So our, our recommendation would be engaging in virtual meetings, such as the one we are having right now, uh, both for your clients and visitors. Just limit, limit any, any instance of personal or physical uh, interactions. Uh, third option and our last option is working in shifts to avoid overcrowding in the workplace or in the office. Now, 
under this instance, you could exploit the option of maybe working from on, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, um, where that is possible. Under some circumstances, it may not be possible, but still, just to ensure the safety of the workplace, you could exploit an option where other employees, especially in large organizations, where other employees report in the morning, others report in the afternoon, and or others report this week, other, and then they don't show up next week, just to ensure that your operations go on and the threat of contracting coronavirus is, is also minimized. That will mark the end of my presentation and I will hand over back to Lisa for the Q&A. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kevin, uh, for those really, really valuable insights. We have a few minutes left, but there's some really interesting questions that I definitely think that we should address. So I'll just move to that really, really quickly. The first is, um, is there a limit to the number of people who would be in an office? So also specifically spaces like co-working spaces? Oh, okay. Uh, good question, but there is no limit. There is no limit to the number of persons who can be in a work office. However, uh, if if you can guarantee two meters uh, social distance in the workplace, then admit as as many people as you can in the workplace. But where that is not possible, then you have to consider the size of your work workspace and just the number of people who work in that place because looking at the advisory from the Directorate of Occupational Safety and Health Services, uh, they require two meters front, uh, sideways, as well as behind. So look, taking that into consideration, it will dictate just how many people can be uh, in a single workplace. Okay, thank you for that. The other question is, if employers are required to get staff in the workplace tested, then how often does this need to be carried out? Also considering that, let's say you get tested today and it's negative and then you contract again, maybe you might contract it uh, tomorrow or another day. Um, so how often should that happen? Okay, firstly, I think uh, the first one has misquoted me. There's no requirement for an employer to actually uh, test employees at the workplace. However, uh, what an employer can do is there's the, there are rules on medical examination and the, every time an, an employer can actually require employees to go get tested and then come with a certificate of fitness or a COVID-19 free certificate to the workplace. Now the frequency of testing, as I've said before, is, is there's no requirement, there's no stipulation as to how frequently a person should be tested for COVID-19. And therefore, employees must take individual responsibility where you interact with people uh, at uh, weddings, at funerals, or social occasions where you traveled. Every time you do that, you, you, you must be alive to the fact that you could have exposed yourself to COVID-19. And therefore, after every such social interactions, such employees must go for testing. Okay, great. We've got another question still around um, testing. If an employee tests positive for COVID-19 at a health facility and reports it to the employer, does the employer have to report this positive case with the authorities or will the reporting have been done by the health facility? Now, a person, a person who, the whole purpose of reporting to government authorities is so that they can take charge of the situation. So a person who finds themselves to be uh, COVID-19 positive should inform the employer of the same, and then they will exploit the option of their sick leave. So during that period, because it's two weeks of staying away from the office, the employee should not report to the workplace. So as soon as, as an employee tests positive, at, at a hospital, then that, that responsibility, they, what the employer should tell the employee is, do not come to the workplace until you are declared COVID-19 free. Got it, okay, great. Um, another question here, is a landlord legally obligated to ensure that facilities are available, something like hand washing facilities, or is it a mere duty or recommendation to do so? Under the provisions of the Occupiers Liability Act, Cap 34 of the laws of Kenya, a landlord is an occupier 
an occupier is defined as a person who has physical occupation of premises or the physical control. The person can dictate who comes into the premises or who does who is not allowed into the premises. Therefore, the duty is the common duty of care to all persons who come into that premise and they should ensure the reasonable safety of such persons as they come into those premises. Therefore, in light of COVID-19, to ensure the safety of persons coming within premises under your control, you should institute measures such as provision of hand sanitizers at the entrance, the provision of hand washing facilities. That's why you're seeing everywhere now, you, you'd see at the entrance that, that those buckets as well as sanitizers at the door, just to ensure that persons who enter those premises have washed their hands properly, they have sanitized, that they've had their temperatures checked as, as part of uh, their duties as occupiers of those premises. This duty is both an, an employer as well as a landlord can be defined as uh, an occupier of those premises. So the duty is there. It's a statutory duty, not a recommendation. It is a statutory duty to ensure the safety of premises under your control. And therefore, owing to that, uh, the threat of COVID-19, if that is not provided, is, is increased. Therefore, landlords as well as employers must take active steps towards ensuring hand washing facilities, sanitizers where possible, as well as uh, the requirement for face masks and all that, the notices that we put in the places. Okay, um, I think you can squeeze in just two more questions. Um, we've got a very interesting one here. Can employers require employees who live with vulnerable people, so the elderly or a pregnant partner, um, to show up at work? And if not, what laws protect this interest, ensuring that they don't risk exposing vulnerable people to COVID? Now, that's really interesting because our hospitals are overwhelmed at the moment. And therefore, home-based care is the alternative that has been recommended as international best practice, as well as uh, that is being adopted in Kenya. Therefore, where an employee lives with a person who is, uh, who is where you are, consider an option where you are taking care of a person who's COVID-19. You already, the moment you're taking care of such a person, you are a high-risk person to the uh, workplace. Therefore, inform, inform your employer of the same, and just ensure you are quarantined and that you take care. As soon as you are declared COVID-19 free, then you can go back to the workplace. If persons who, uh, I talked of persons who are vulnerable to COVID-19, including uh, persons with diabetes and existing pre-existing conditions, even, even women, with, or pregnant women for that matter. A pregnant woman has uh, the potential of attracting diseases and that is not a really good position you are, you'd want to put your employees at the workplace. Therefore, where possible, such persons should just work from home and when the time for delivery, they, they can exploit their maternity leave when the time comes for it. Got it. Um, our last question is, in view of the WIBA Act, would an employer be legally liable and expected to compensate an employee if they contract COVID um, during um, his, his or her course of work or on the way to work? Um, firstly, it is important to note that COVID-19 is not considered as an occupational disease by the WIBA. Uh, looking at that uh, Schedule 2 of WIBA, you'd find there are a number of listed diseases and COVID-19 is not one of them. However, a reading of section 38 uh, just dictates that any other disease that may be uh, contracted at the workplace. And this is why the Director of Occupational Safety and Health may just declare, or the Director under Weber might just declare COVID-19 to be an occupational disease. Therefore, a person who contracts COVID-19 at the workplace and that COVID-19 is uh, contracted in and during the course of the execution of their duties is liable to compensation. A person is eligible for compensation by the employer. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Kevin. I think we've covered majority of the questions. Um, I think we can end it here today. Again, thank you so much, Kevin and the Kangwana and Co, and Co team for helping us put this together. And also thank you so much for joining us for today's session. And we look forward to hosting you again. Have a good evening.